Well, I want to move us along to a, a section here that we're doing in adapting called adapting and uh, really talk about Sequoia itself and, and how you're adapting. And I remember when we interviewed Doug, he spoke of the war room days of managing the 1999 fund um, after the dot-com crash. What does the Sequoia war room of March 2020 look like, uh, especially as you literally can't be in a war room together? No, <laughs> the virtual war room. You know, the other thing which, which is challenging is we have our uh, biennial LP meeting next week. And just, just for context, it was originally supposed to be in India. And then in January, we started to worry, given what we were seeing in China. So we actually moved it in January from India to California, because we thought there were going to be issues in this early uh, April, late March timeframe. Mm -hmm. Just concretely, we took action. And then obviously, uh, having it in California started to, to not look feasible. So we've moved it to a virtual LP meeting. So in the midst of preparing for a very important event for us, I mean, our LPs are our customers and we want to do, we want to have a great show for them in some sense and provide candid feedback and reporting on our funds. At the same time, you know, we're running around like crazy looking after our portfolio companies. Um, the most important thing we focused on over the last two weeks is our companies. You know, Sequoia as a business, we've been around, uh, you know, almost five decades, you know, we're not in a, in a tough but fortunately, um, but some of our companies really do face challenges. And so we've really oriented everything towards what is best for our companies. Uh, we've built a bunch of online tools. So we have resources where we can all look at things. We have daily standups uh, using Zoom so that everybody can stay in touch. We understand what the prioritization is. Uh, and we that's use among many the more partnership? Within the partnership, yes. So that as a team, since we, you know, what do you do to make the, the effect of being in the office together so that we just stay in touch a little bit more frequently. Um, and we've created these online resources. And probably the most important thing we've done is to do a, a, a very thorough analysis of the portfolio health. So literally company by company across every single company in the US, we've gone down to figure out, okay, at year end in December, what was the expected runway based on cash and burn then? What do we think it is now, given the change to circumstances? And which are the two, three dozen companies where we really need to spend most of our attention? Some companies are early stage, six people, product development. I mean, in some sense, they're unaffected. They're just building the product and hope to launch next year. And then there are other companies that are really affected significantly. And so as a team, we try to figure out how do we rally around them and how do we bring resources to bear to help them navigate through this tricky period? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. As as you sort of frame that up um, around um, around the portfolio companies, you know it sounds obvious that of course you would spend time with your portfolio companies. What are the things that you're not doing as much of that you would normally be spending your your days doing, um, and how has sort of this time mm -hmm. forced you to change that? It seems like we're doing more of everything. <laughs> Sleeping, <laughs> honestly. No, no, less of that too. Um, no, because I mean, interviews are, are still going on. We're just doing them all as virtual interviews. I do think there are probably one or two hires somewhere where you, you're going to wait to m meet the person in person before you make a formal final hiring decision. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, we're onboarding people remotely. We did this on Monday. We had a, a person who joined who, you know, first virtual onboarding for us as our portfolio companies are doing. I was on, on a call earlier today with a company and they onboarded 21 people on Monday uh, remotely. And, you know, people are going to keep hiring and they're going to keep building products. So I think a lot of those things stay the same. Uh, we continue to make investments. Um, you know, we, we formally approved uh, two new Series A investments uh, last week. <laughs> uh, and those meetings were virtual meetings. Um, so business continues. Yeah, does does uh, has something changed in what you look for in companies uh, compared to call it two three months ago? In some sense, not. I mean, certainly not at the Series A stage because I think the you know those companies need they're at such an early stage. The product needs to be so differentiated and really solve a problem that would transcend the current market. I mean, obviously, if the, if the US is shut down indefinitely, that's a different situation, but. You know, these companies all have a sound value proposition. And once things are a little bit more normal, even if the economy goes through a recession, we believe in these businesses because they're really solving really important problems. And so we have confidence in them. 
we have asked people how they plan to respond to a changing circumstance, a little bit of a test on whether they're nimble, are they flexible, or are they just tone deaf to the reality of the world we're in right now? So that clearly is a question we're asking that's different. Uh, and then we're also spending time thinking about what new categories may be unfairly favored sort of post uh, Corona um, and Do you end up with digital health companies, uh, online education, um, a bunch of things may change. And are we forced into a behavior change through this environment we're in now that sticks? I think it's a really interesting question. I, a lot of people are thinking about this. I think it's a really interesting thing to try to, you know, you know conjecture. Yeah. Well, that's maybe that's the perfect transition to kind of the, the topic we wanted to wrap up with you on. Um, I was thinking about it when you mentioned your your LP meeting next week, which, man, I feel for you. I know how important those are, having done them, <laughs> attended them and everything. And it was interesting. Just yesterday, I attended one virtually. Um, and it was amazing that it was actually better. Uh, you know, these tend to be pretty dry affairs. Um, and I wonder this is a small example, but either through the LP meeting or, or more broadly, have you guys started to think about what kind of permanent changes to Sequoia might come out of this? I think we're going to be, we'd already seen in a trend where uh, companies are becoming more distributed, partly because the cost of living in the Bay Area is so high um, and the cost of hiring engineers is just so high. We've, we've already seen a trend where companies are willing to tolerate remote work by individuals or multiple remote development offices. I think that trend is going to gather steam. Um, I think you're going to run this experiment that's actually measurable on how people perform in this kind of an environment. Um, so I think that just objectively is going to change the debate because um, I think it's so easy. We, you know, As humans, we resist behavior change whenever we can, and this is forcing behavior change. So, so I think so tolerating businesses that are distributed um, learning how to work effectively with distributed teams. I think we're likely to see people start companies in many more places. And again, that's a trend that had already started. You know, Silicon Valley doesn't have a monopoly on idea generation. Um, and I think many more people will start companies elsewhere. So we probably need to be more willing to fly or if not fly given uh, health issues to online assessments of companies. So I think those well, are the changes. You know, you all are organized, uh, or at least have been to this point geographically, for a company, and I think there are going to be a lot more of these, like Zapier, right? Like we had Wade on the show. Mm -hmm. They have no office. Um, how do you guys, th how are you going to think about a company like that in the future? Is that a U.S. investment? Is that a global oh, yeah. investment? <laughs> like, is it, who meets them? Uh, well, you know, honestly, so we've run into a couple of conflicts like this, but I don't actually think of them as conflicts. Um, you know, our team in India is an investor in a fabulous company called Freshworks. Most of Freshworks customers are in the developed world, including the US. So, you know, my guess is the majority of the revenue comes from the US, but there was an investment out of our India office because that's where the company is based. And they have a presence in the US too, but we help them. We're one partnership globally. We've, we've done some really clever things behind the scenes to make sure that we feel like a single partnership and how we share knowledge and share compensation and things like that in a way that makes it feel good. And I'd rather have more of those. I mean, that's a great problem to have, honestly. Yeah. One final um, question in this adapting section. There's a lot of folks talking about the sheer amount of dry powder that has been committed to venture firms in this climate. So they're saying, you know, the funding won't slow down because oh my gosh, there's this just billions and billions and billions that's been promised to venture firms. So therefore, deployment should continue at the exact same pace. H how do you think about that? And, and you know, do you think we'll see, like, it's probably too early to tell, but have you thought about, should we slow deployment? Should we change when we want to raise certain funds? Should we change the mix of uh, initial capital deployment versus follow-ons. Does a climate affect something like that for you guys? So the two questions there, I think the one is what are the, what's the LP behavior and the other one is what's our behavior. And so the interesting thing in 2008, maybe not because we had a crystal ball, just because we felt things were a little frothy. Our investment pace had actually slowed down in the first half of 2008 before Lehman happened. And then we accelerated in 2009. So I don't know if, if you've ever done a, a driving course, but I, I went to one once on a Formula One racing track. And the thing that they taught me is you, you brake as hard as you can while the car is going straight before you get to the corner. 
And then you have to figure out how to accelerate at the right point at the apex out of the corner so that you can sprint ahead. And this is exactly the analogy that we want to apply for our companies and for ourselves. You know, we slowed down in 2019, not because we had some crystal ball again that this was going to happen, but we just, it, things didn't quite feel right. If anything, I want to accelerate out of this. I think they're going to be fabulous investment opportunities and great companies to be built. So, so that's what we plan to do. For our LPs, you know, our clients are almost exclusively these endowments, foundations, and nonprofits. And we're really proud of the, the great causes represented by our LPs. Um, we actually got an email earlier this week that about 10 of our LPs, people like the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, the Wellcome Trust, Stanford, MIT, are all working on either better diagnostics, uh, potential treatments, or vaccines for uh, coronavirus. So, so we love the fact that our clients are doing these things. So when we generate profits, it helps them do these sort of things. I think our clients are relatively well protected. But if you talk about the industry at large, I suspect some LPs are going to end up with cash flow issues, just like there are many other businesses that are going to end up with cash flow issues. And that may, at the margin, you know, lower the amount of venture capital being deployed over the next year or two. But I, I, that's total speculation. I don't know.